thank you very much, uh, Professor Terry. First of all, it's a great opportunity to be amongst you today to speak representing my continent, Africa, and also giving you some examples from my own country, Ethiopia. Um, first of all, you know that Africans, we try to uni unify with the Organization of African Unity 50 years uh, ago, and we try to, to evaluate uh, the decolonization process. And we were successful politically to decolonize ourselves, uh, but we have not been successful in many ways, especially serving our citizens, uh, changing the lives of our people, and having good governance, and as well as, uh, uh, again, uh, democratizing Africa. So I think the main issue is uh, the last 15 years or so, uh, you might have been hearing about Africa, that Africa is a rising continent. Africa is a giant, a lion, uh, you know, which has risen from sleeping, a sleeping giant. And many narratives has been uh, spoken about Africa. But my discussion, uh, you know, is informed in five points which I want to mention. The first one is, my continent is a very young continent. That's to say, both in terms of the age of the population, the demography, the structure of the, the demography shows that Africa is a very young uh, continent. Again, not only in terms of demography, but also in terms of uh, natural resources and abundance of uh, opportunities, Africa is still young, which has not been harnessed which calls for a policy choice uh, to base our uh, policies depending on this. So the first thing is, if our population is very young, dynamic, which is also technology friendly, then how can we harness this demographic dividend is one of the main issues that has to be addressed. This has a far reaching uh, implications because it also has uh, something to do with our neighbors, especially Europe. Our young people who are traveling through the Mediterranean, drowning into the sea, uh, needs an opportunity. So the first thing is an opportunity and also a challenge for us in, as a continent. So our policy should be informed by this uh, structure of the demography in Africa. So this is the, the first thing. We in Ethiopia and in, in many countries in, Af in Africa, we recognize this fact and we started by building uh, education, mainly quality education and technical and vocational skills and occup occupational skills. That's very essential to make our young dynamic uh, population to be uh, you know, very active in the economic sphere. Not only in the economic sphere, but Africa has been challenged. One of it is most of our leaders are very old. So now there is a challenge. These young people are impatient. They are asking Africans to have a young leaders who can understand their real quest in the continent. So this is a big challenge. It's a big challenge has continued to be a challenge and something has to be done. An example in my country is my prime minister after me is a 42 years old. So he can understand better than myself. I am 53. So I think this is essentially something which Africa has to address. While we are doing, uh, you know, uh, giving technical and vocational uh, skills and making our young people to be employable, but we have to address also their political quest, which is to engage and be part of the process. You know, many people are saying, you are the future of Africa, but they are saying we are the current leaders of Africa. They are not only future of Africa. So I think this is a, a big issue which informs our policy decision. In Ethiopia, we are trying to address this issue. The second is the gender issue. Again, uh, if we want to serve our people, the gender imbalance issue has to be addressed. 
So this, some countries in Africa are trying to address this issue, especially in the leadership uh, at the high level. Uh, we are now 50-50 uh, in our cabinet, uh, you know, 50% of women and 50% of men in Ethiopia. Similarly in Rwanda and many other African countries are also now emulating. I think this is the basic challenge because 50% of our population, even in Africa, beyond 50% are women. And without embracing this section of the society, we cannot move forward in Africa. I, th I think this is a very important issue and should be addressed uh, in a way that resolves the, the, the thing. The second issue which uh, informed uh, policy decisions in, in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia and in Africa is disruptive technologies and the you know, advancement of digital economy. I think this is also a very important issue we have to address. If we want to expedite economic growth and have a vibrant economy in the country, we have to leapfrog uh, with the technological advancement, and this is an opportunity for Africa. So I think the second issue we focused is in this area, with the e-governance, e-commerce, uh, e-services, both in government and private uh, entities. And uh, I think these are very important issues that we have uh, to look into. And this helps to integrate us in Africa. You know, there is infrastructure deficit in Africa. And if we, ha we have to leapfrog and address this physical infrastructure deficit, we need to go further in uh, digital economy and, and, and digital technology, which helps us to move faster. So I think this is uh, the second issue. The third is on, um, you know, there is throat cutting competition amongst the global competitors. All of them are looking into Africa. Now Africa is no more a humanitarian case. Africa has become a trade and investment case now. So I think this has to be properly understood. Things have changed. You know, used to be a basket case and humanitarian case, but now that has, is, uh, is in the process of changing. So I think if that's the case, how can we work with the global competitors in an amicable way, where uh, when everybody comes to Africa to work in, invest in, uh, to have a coordinated uh, effect it, in Ethiopia, we have uh, some examples where, you know, different corners, the east and the west and the south uh, are cooperating in uh, helping the country to move forward. So we work with the United States, we work with the European Union, we work with China, we work with Japan, we work with uh, Middle East. So I think um, used to be, you know, you have to side some part in their fight, and that is not the case now. I, I, we have to be very conscious in Africa to get all the necessary support from all corners of the globe. I think this competition helps Africa to move forward, but on the other hand, it has an impeding uh, uh, situation, and, and we have to see that it is a coordinated uh, effort. I think uh, with the emergence of these global players, now, if you take an example of my country, uh, which has moved uh, the last 15 years in double-digit growth uh, of 10.3%, which is uh, similar to Korea in 1960s or China in uh, recent years. So I think this kind of economic growth is very essential because without a fast and accelerated economic growth, reduction of poverty in Africa will remain to be, you know, at, at its low level. So we need to move very fast, you know, uh, out of the 10 global fast-growing uh, economies, uh, six of them are in Africa, but that still is not enough. 54 countries, but we have to move very fast in economic growth. But my country is a stark example in this regard, uh, having achieved uh, this and, and uh, bringing about uh, poverty reduction uh, for millions of people uh, in the country, which is uh, about 100 million uh, population. Um, I think we have huge challenge in Africa 
in terms of another you know, fourth point, which informs our policy choice, is state capture and poor governance, which is very, very uh, determinant for fast economic growth. And I see state fragility in some parts, and some of the African countries are failed states. So we have to work very hard to bring all the African nations to the same level of uh, peace and tranquility and growth. So in this regard, I, I believe that the fight, zero, to zero tolerance for corruption, and poor governance addressed, and above all, our citizens' participation, civil society movement, if there is no proper civilized um, you know, activism, then it's very difficult to control governments. So I think you know, the civil society movement should be at the core of African uh, you know, growth uh, and development narrative. So I, I believe that um, this is one of uh, the main issues we have to address. The FIBS is, you know, there is resource depletion. And there is also uh, you know, climate change issue, which is very essential. Africa contributing very less to the global greenhouse gas emission. But the most attacked and impacted continent is Africa. So we need justice. A climate justice is always should be there at the core of our policy making. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, civilized countries or developed countries uh, with their uh, actions, uh, because of this, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emission, Africa is suffering. But we wanted to take, uh, you know, responsibility as uh, global responsible citizens. We in Ethiopia, we designed climate smart or resilient green growth strategy, where we have to be morally responsible and show to developed countries that even though we are contributing very, very less to the global greenhouse gas emission, we have to take responsibility by our, ourselves. And I, as a late comers, we have that advantage and we should show that. In this regard, we focused on smart agriculture, which is climate smart agriculture, and uh, you know, eco uh, industrial parks, and environmentally friendly industrial uh, development, we also worked as yesterday, Morocco has given us an example uh, on renewable energies, uh, which reduces the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, all the potentials we have, we are harnessing. For example, my country, Ethiopia, has huge potential from hydro, 60,000 megawatts. We have geothermal potential, uh, 20,000 megawatts. And we have wind, it is abundant, 1.1 gigawatts of uh, uh, energy capacity and solar, you know, Africa is abundantly endowed with. So I think all these renewable energy sources we are harnessing. Ethiopia, we currently we have an installed capacity of around uh, 5,000. 95% of it is from renewable sources. And again, we are building uh, and 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 uh, uh, having facilities more than 50,000 megawatts under construction. So all this shows that we took uh, responsibility by our own, but we demand also the global community to act. And uh, we do not agree with the policy of certain countries who are uh, backtracking from the Paris Agreement, because I think this is detrimental for our children, for our uh, existence in the future. So I think we have to save our planet, and we are setting an example in, uh, in our countries. Um, beyond that, we have problems with terrorism, uh, violent extremism, which has to be addressed. It's a challenge. It's a challenge because if we don't create jobs to our young people, there is no option for them to survive or thrive in the countries. So they opt for any kind of extreme, extreme, extreme ideology comes in, they accept it. So it is up to us to address the, the problems of our young people who are joining these terrorist groups and uh, violent extremism uh, taking place in many places. So I think these are uh, the main issues that uh, inform our policy and implementation. And fairly, we are successful in many ways. 
and uh, uh, we will continue with this. And the best practices and examples exist in many African countries, but we have to emulate those things and scale up to uh, many African countries. I thank you.